Welcome back to another Jack Reacts. So this is a UK housing market crash video by a guy called Toby Nubert. And it's doing really well, so I'm hoping the information is good. I'm probably gonna speed through some bits to save you listening to the lot and this being an overly long video. But let's see what he thinks of the impending crash. As you all know, I think 2023 will be a huge, ginormous, horrendous property crash. And I sold my family home and everything else that we have to hedge my bets that that was gonna happen. I'm not an economist, I just have a feeling in my gut and have had for a while. And when my gut feels that strong, I go with it. So let's see the video. So according to the latest figures, UK house prices hit £295,903. That's from the latest government data. However, there's definitely- I always think these stats are pointless. Absolutely pointless. Gives you no indication of like, what does that mean? It gives me no idea about anything, that figure. Definitely some cracks starting to show and data from Nationwide, who are one of the biggest providers of mortgages in the UK, are actually suggesting that prices have actually fallen for the first time since last month, actually dropping 0.9%. Now that might not sound a lot, but it's actually the biggest fall monthly since July 2021, and it's the biggest fall since June 2020. Now this does lead us onto the big question, is this just a blip on the road, or is the kind of unstoppable rise of housing prices in the UK about to come to an end, and we're gonna see some sort of crash in the housing market? Because surely things can't just keep going up and up forever, or can they? I think talking about housing in the mortgage market is probably one of the most interesting topics because if you asked anyone on the street, they'd say that investing in bricks and mortar is probably one of the most secure investments you can make. And I guess it's not really a surprise when you actually look back at the long-term price chart from around 2005 or so on this data, you can see since then house prices have actually nearly doubled to where they are today. And I think the most impressive thing, of course, when you think about that stat, is that that's happened even through a great financial crash. And actually, if you work out the average price increase from 2005 to where we are today, that actually sits above 4% on a compounded annual growth rate, which seems pretty good. And what I like about that figure, first of all, it shows you long term, think of property long term. Yes, you can make short term money with things like deal sourcing, but if you're investing, think end of your life investing. This stuff's gonna sit there and it's gonna continually pay you. So this figure here, amazing house price growth, 4% a year. So people would look at that and go, 4% But 4% is probably 3% above what your bank are paying you right now in an interest rate. Not only that, this doesn't take into consideration the rent that you're receiving. Therefore, that percentage is way higher in terms of the return on your money. And it also doesn't factor in any you know, potential works that you've done to it to get that ad additional return either. So yeah, that figure's great to see. As a worst case scenario, you ignore the fact you've ever received rent, your, your property price is still going up 4%. And let's not forget, you've got a 75% mortgage, so your money's only 25%, but the whole property is going up 4% per year. Good to me. So definitely good if you managed to hold on to some bricks and mortar during that time. However, a little bit annoying for people that have tried to get on the ladder because ultimately, more than 4%, that's twice as much as what the Bank of England want as their inflation rate. So anything going above and beyond 2% a year is definitely going to start getting out of reach for a lot of people. So the reason I wanted to make this video really all comes down to the fact that interest rates have been rising so quickly and of course we've got inflation out of control currently in the UK. And this is putting a huge amount of pressure first. That's a crazy, crazy graph when you actually look at that. It's mad though because we've just got used to, uh, in the last decade, having ground zero interest rates and thinking that would last forever and, it, and now it hasn't people are panicking but i think with property like anything you can only go off what, what you've got today so if your rate is seven percent today then you buy a property based on a seven percent rate it's not that complicated or painful the interest is what you pay to borrow the money and unless you can borrow it cheaper which is what we're currently considering at the moment with private investors who maybe want five percent rather than seven on their money because they can get a first charge on the property, meaning it's as secure as it gets. See on people that want to get on the property ladder as first time buyers, but also all of us who maybe need to remortgage in the next couple of years. And we've all been getting used to really, really low rates of kind of below 2% or so. In fact, all of that in then add on all the cost of living pressures that we're seeing at the moment with energy prices going up through the roof. Are we headed toward one of the biggest crashes in the property market that we've ever seen? Well, before we make any crazy judgments like that. Yes. Now, let's just keep our sensible hats on just for the time being. Let's firstly talk about these issues one by one. We'll go through interest rates first. Now, as you might have seen, the Bank of England just raised the interest rate up to 3%, which was 75 basis points from where they were before. So they were sat at 2.25% before, and now they're at a record high of 3%, a record high at least in the last decade or so. Now, we've not actually seen rates as high as 3% in the UK. We have to go all the way back to the Great Financial Crash, and they were actually 3% around the end of the financial crash or during the financial crash when rates were actually coming all the way down. But since then, of course, as most of you will know, rates have been 
been so low, and basically money's been pretty much free to borrow. Now, if we go back a little bit further, of course, we can see that 5.75% was actually the peak just before the Great Financial Crisis actually hit the UK, and that was as high as interest rates actually got. Now, those interest rates set by the Bank of England are really key, especially when we look at mortgage rates. Now, of course, every time the interest rate gets risen, the mortgage rates that you'll see out there in the wild, out there in the private market, are, of course, going to keep going up and up and up, as, of course, those lenders are going to want to get their premium on top of whatever that base rate is. Now, if you look at some of the best rates out there currently, if you're going to either be a first time buyer or going to get a remortgage for yourself, you're actually looking right now. Like I say, we've just had something agreed at just over 7%. But it doesn't matter because the deal works at 7%. So who cares? In two years time, it might be half that and then the deal's even better. So if anything, I think it teaches people to be a little bit more careful when, when they're borrowing at a 75% level because your, number, your deals really have to be good to make those numbers work. And therefore, should these rates come back down again to, to the levels that we've seen in the last decade, the deals that you've got are gonna be insane. But equally, like I say, there is also that opportunity. Why not use private money? There's plenty of money out there with people wanting security. You give them a first charge on a property instead of the mortgage and give them 5% instead of the seven, then they're gonna be super happy. You're gonna be able to move much quicker, be able to have a conversation with a human being about the deal and what you think is, is good for it and build a relationship with that person rather than a bank who doesn't give a about you. Yeah, just a much nicer experience. So maybe that's the way that people should start looking here is, is can you find wealthy individuals, high net worths and, um, and just borrow the, the money directly from them. I feel like this guy's a mortgage broker, I've got to say. He's, uh, he's very knowledgeable about this sort of stuff. Around 5.75 to even 6.5% from some lenders. Now, without any context, that's not going to make any sense. Let's actually just take some real-world examples and say what that's actually going to make a real difference in the real world. Okay, so let's just go for an example and I'll put this on screen now. If we assume we've got, say, a £200,000 mortgage left on our home and then 25 years left to pay, with an interest rate around 2%, we're paying around £848 a month. Now, you change that rate to 6%, things start to get a little bit crazy in your monthly... This is why there'll be a big crash, because homeowners and people that have got in with a 5% deposit when it comes to a refinance are f quite frankly and that's not even talking about the fact that utilities have tripled and the cost of living their groceries their normal stuff has gone through the roof people cannot afford this anymore there will then be the property will get taken off them they will go into probably a level of depression it's going to be mental it's, it's a super interesting time to, to watch but i cannot see how people don't believe that this is going to cause a crash payments go up to £1,289. That's more than a 50% jump in that payment from that original number. So right off the bat, that leaves us with a couple of really big issues. First time buyers especially, they're either gonna have to increase their deposit massively or reduce their budget by a huge amount. But there's only so far they can reduce their budget because of course you may not even get a house, even find an average house price if they're gonna increase so much. And again, just keeping on those examples, let's say if we did wanna keep our costs below £900 a month in that same example, let's just say, because that's what our budget is, we'd only actually be able to borrow £135,000 on a 6% interest rate compared to nearly £200,000 if we had a 2% interest rate. So when you consider it from a buying power perspective, our buying power as a first time buyer is being reduced by 30% or around that. Again, if you're an investor, this is great because there's less people in the market, meaning that properties aren't disappearing like they are today. And if you've got cash in the bank, you're liquid. This is what they always say, make sure you're liquid, which is why I sold everything. Make sure you're liquid in a downturn market because you have the pick of the bunch and you can pick up a load of really good deals and potentially set yourself up for life in a two year period. A kind of number when we're trying to keep the budget the same. Now, the reason that's so important for first time buyers is because first time buyers make up around 50% or so of the overall market. So if first time buyers can't get on the ladder and help keep those property prices high, well, unfortunately, something else has to happen to that whole supply and demand in the market. So that means you can pretty much make a well-educated guess and say, if there's no more demand in the market and the supply remains the same, there's only one thing that could possibly happen to those prices. Now, let's also not forget about current homeowners too. Now, I did a community poll recently just asking about all of you and where you were. And lots of you seem to have been fixed in, luckily, for the last few years on some nice low rates. But there are definitely quite a few of you out there who are going to have to remortgage in the next couple of years. And unfortunately, this probably means that you're going to end... You should ask then, okay, is compared to what? Why is it expensive? And the biggest thing when it comes to house prices is really we're talking about affordability. So how much percentage of your take home pay actually goes toward the mortgage? And this is where things- Beer, always go by the price of beer. I remember a year or two ago when I couldn't believe five pound a pint. And now five pound a pint is an absolute bargain. It's an absolute bargain, which is horrendous. Six quid, up to seven quid in London, that's- Things get really interesting. So as you can see on screen now, here's the long-term average that goes back to the 1980s. 
And this shows what percentage of people's take home pay they end up paying for their mortgage. So the gray line here shows the long-term average. And it shows that it's around just under 30% is the amount of money which people tend to spend on their mortgage. Now, the key thing here is to focus on is with that rise in interest rate, what does that actually do for affordability? Now, as you can see on this point here, on this red dot that says 5.5% mortgage rate. Now, at that point, those take home pay levels start to look pretty dangerous at those levels around the great financial crash. Now, bear in mind already that this data is already out of date because we're already talking. If we look on the market now at the kind of rates that we're getting, we're kind of looking already above 6%. So this little red dot here really should be shifted up even further. And this is definitely going to be a major problem for new first time buyers trying to get on the market. And just to make things worse, we need to talk about one of the other biggest issues when it comes to affordability, and that's everything currently going on with the- That's insane, by the way. Put that into perspective. 50% of your income is going on the mortgage. That isn't all of your living expenses. That's just the mortgage payment. Then you've got your utilities. Then you've got your food. Then you've got your phone bill. Like, this isn't- People can't live like this. How are people not getting this? You cannot live like this. Go and look up our partnership program and let me help you make some money. If you're sitting there watching this going, wow, I'm in trouble, do something. Don't bury your head in the sand. It's time to do something. To earn an extra 500 quid a month is not hard. Legitimately, genuinely, I know it sounds ridiculous, but to put a little bit of extra time in, learning some stuff, you're already here learning stuff on YouTube, take the step. Whether it be with us in the partnership program, I'd love to help you. If it's somewhere else doing something else, do it, anything but you have to act now because next year it's gonna be too late and you'll be f So start earning that money this side of the year and give yourself half a chance to survive in this. The cost of living crisis. Now, as we all know, the price of energy that we've been paying has gone up massively over the past few months and the government's had to come up with a price cap to prevent some people's bills from basically making them bankrupt. Even with that price cap, people are still paying more for their energy than they were, say, a couple of years ago. And that's going to put a huge amount of pressure on everyone's take home pay and what they can actually afford, especially if they're looking to get on the market or maybe about to remortgage. Now, of course, just to add some more fuel to that fire, no pun intended, those energy costs, of course, feed into everything else that we buy, including food costs you would have seen go up at the supermarkets and all the other costs that we've seen go up around us, which, of course, all adds up and plays their part. Now, at the moment in the UK, inflation is running above 10 percent. So that means that anything that would have cost us around £100 last year is now costing us around 110 So maybe that's the weekly shop or maybe just to fill up the car. So ultimately, everything feeds in together. You've got all your energy costs, all the costs of the cost of living crisis, everything going up with inflation. And that all feeds into a very dangerous place at the moment of what might happen now to the housing market as people potentially are reaching that breaking point where they can no longer afford to pay all their costs. So keeping on that topic of affordability, one area that we need to have a little look at is of course the jobs market because it's all good saying what used to cost us 100 pounds is now inflating and going to cost us on average 110 pounds if our wages also increase with that then we wouldn't really be a problem but the issue at the moment is the wages as well that people are being paid on average aren't increasing fast enough to cover those costs of inflation which effectively is reducing their pricing power and no doubt for a lot of you you do work in the public sector especially you'll be feeling that pinch over the past few years pretty horribly now one of the key things we can possibly look at here is real wage growth now of course that's the amount you're paid but we're accounting for inflation here now it's no good if you say i've been increased my pay rise by five percent for example if inflation hits you with ten percent then your actual real wage growth would be negative five percent so let me just bring this up on screen now and let's have a look at the latest data now as you can see long-term trends haven't exactly been great for real wage growth so although they've been going up unfortunately inflation's been eating a big part of that now as you can see on screen some of the most recent data unfortunately with that really high level of inflation real wage growth has been going down so people's disposable income and the disposable pay that actually be able to spend on stuff like the mortgage and for the housing market in general is of course going down and especially as well for first-time buyers who are trying to send for that deposit when you see things like that is, that's an important point as well to distinguish between the two so a crash and a correction a correction can look like a crash so if this year property's gone up be extreme 50 percent so 100 grand house this year is now worth 200 grand if it corrects and actually drops 50 percent and it's that 100 grand house which was went up to 200 is now 150 next year it will look like a big crash because that's a 50 percent reduction in that in the value of that home but actually it's not because this was almost artificial the extreme uplift 
a doubling of that, you know, 100% uplift, doubling the, the value of that home has now gone down 50%, makes it look like the market's just crashed 50%, but actually that was unsustainable and therefore it's a correction to a, a, a normal level. So it's always quite difficult to distinguish between a crash and a correction. This, this cannot be good for the housing market. So the bottom line for all this is quite an interesting one because at the end of the day, the housing market, just like any other market, is all based on supply and demand. And of course, if there's more and more demand for a set number of houses which aren't really increasing over many, many years, then of course that's gonna keep those prices high. But the moment that we get some kind of imbalance, then of course something has to happen, whether we get a big crash or whether we get a big correction, of course, that's up for anyone to guess. Now saying that, it's an interesting market, of course, because lots of people in that buying and selling and in that supply and demand don't necessarily have to buy or sell. Of course, if you can stay put, you're on a fixed mortgage and you're okay and you're covering yourself, you're not really bothered. What this really hurts, unfortunately though, is those first time buyers, especially who wanted to get on the ladder. And as we said before, because they make up such a big set of the market, they're gonna reduce that demand significantly. And then of course, what happens to supply? Again, it all depends on whether people have to move and have to make that decision. Now also a smaller part of the market, but certainly an interesting one, is gonna be all of those buy to let landlords. And no doubt there's quite a few of you out there as well who might have bought a property to rent out. Now at the moment with interest rates the way they are, anyone looking looking to do a property for buy to let is no doubt looking at the numbers and thinking there is no way those are going to happen again. And of course, for a long amount of time, buy to let has been pretty much a money printing machine. If you're able to put up with the stress of tenants and managing property, certainly you've been able to get money for nearly free from the bank, just a couple of percentage points. And then actually the rent and whatever you get from your tenants has managed to cover that mortgage and you made a profit. But now if you look at the rents that those properties are going to be able to achieve, they probably won't cover any brand new mortgages that you take out now, unless of course you've got loads of stacks of cash that you're able to probably put in for a deposit, but it's certainly going to hurt those Yield. So it's going to be very interesting even on that market, which again takes away even more demand if you include first time buyers and throw them in also with buy to let landlords. Love them or hate them, unfortunately, they're all part of that same market. So seemingly it would be an obvious conclusion then that house prices have to come down, right? If the demand is not going to be there, there's only one way. Now are they going to crash or correct by 20 to 30 percent or even maybe a slower kind of decline? Or is it going to be like the great financial crash? Now I definitely veer away from saying things are going to be like the great financial crash. Ultimately, that's when things were taken a little bit too far. We're not anymore seeing any 110, 115 percent mortgages out there. And lenders are a lot more careful how they lend to people these days, and they are being more stress tested. But of course, with rates heading toward 6%, that still is going to hurt a lot of people. So the big question is what happens from here? Well, the market is pricing in approximately interest rate rises up to around the 5 and the 5.25% mark sometime in 2023. But at the end of the day, that's all just a complete guess. Now, if that were to happen, that could have some serious negative effects on the economy. And that's what one of the deputy governors at the Bank of England has said. That it Great video, really well put together. Like I say, I reckon I've got sneaky suspicion he's there. A mortgage broker because he knows a hell of a lot about very intricate parts of the economy really good so i'll be checking out more of his stuff certainly bang the subscribe button so i've put his details in below this video as well so please do um, if you liked this video go check him out as well but for now see you later Are you still